Hello, this is Mike at Game From Scratch. Uh, if you've been watching our channel recently or been visiting GameFromScratch.com, you've probably noticed a couple of posts have popped up about getting started and set up using MonoGame. Uh, that's because I'm embarking on a brand new series, uh, beginning to end coverage of MonoGame. Uh, you've seen the beginning, the stuff on getting up and going. Uh, there's going to be an introductory post coming soon. Uh, but this here video is an introduction to MonoGame itself, so that you guys that have never heard of it or are unfamiliar or just kind of have a gist of what's going on, uh, I'll give you a bit more detail. Uh, it's going to be a combination of a bit of a history lesson and then a bit of an overview of what's there now. Uh, I'm, as I said, starting a brand new series from beginning to end. It's going to be both text and video. And as a new thing, I'm actually going to be publishing um, a free ebook for patron backers. Um, so it's going to be basically the same content that you get on the blog or on the, the video site, but um, it's going to be compiled into book form. So if that interests you, be sure to check that out. Uh, but our, what we're going to do here is cover every aspect of making a game in mono game uh, the basic aspects so you know we're not gonna cover every single detail but we're going to cover all the parts of using the library uh, from 2d drawing text on screen sprites uh, input handling audio handling uh, to 3d textures special effects etc uh, so hopefully we're gonna run the entire gamut of working with mono game now you probably might be sitting back there going well, what the hell is a mono game and that's where this post comes in. Uh, today we're going to give you a bit of an overview of what Mono Game is, and I shall start with a history lesson. Uh, you see, back in 2004, Microsoft released a product called XNA, a very forward-thinking product. This actually, in some ways, you could argue, launched the indie movement. That's huge now, which is kind of funny, because then Microsoft turned around and shot themselves in both feet and are considered a bit player now, while Sony is eating their lunch. But that's a different story. Uh, XNA, as I said, was launched back in 2004 in the uh, Game Developer Conference. It was weird, though. Uh, if you were around for the time of the conference, they actually announced it at the same time they announced Build. Uh, build is now the integrated uh, build tool in the back end of all the Visual Studio products. It's a very cool thing um, that has come about as a result of it. But uh, it was basically a build management system. Then XNA was this other thing on top. It was going to be this... Um, library content system bundled together thing um, that made the Xbox accessible to indie developers. The weird thing is, Build came out right away, and at the same time they also actually released the source code uh, for Mech Commander 2, uh, a real-time strategy game based on the uh, Battletech universe. Uh, so that was cool, uh, but XNA itself sort of disappeared for two years. And then uh, XNA Game Studio 1 was released, I believe it was around 2006. Now, XNA Game Studio was basically a version of um, Visual Studio tools. Now, at the time, Visual Studio still cost two or three grand to use, and they were just starting to get into the whole idea of the Express versions, um, which were stripped down uh, but free versions for amateur developers. Well, uh, Build was, sorry, um, XNA Game Studio was basically a version of Express slash Visual Studio, but with this set of tools specifically for creating games, this content importer tools, as well as this game library, XNA. Now, XNA itself stands for absolutely nothing. It's a recursive algorithm that says um, XN... Uh, I should remember that right off the top of my head, but uh, XNA is not an acronym or something to that effect. It's the same thing as... Um, GNU. I believe GNU is a recursive algorithm. It doesn't really matter. Basically, at the time, uh, because of the popularity of DirectX, uh, Microsoft was slapping an X in front of just about everything. Uh, this was the era of Extreme and movies like Triple X and Mountain Dew Extreme and so on and so forth. So Xs were very unpopular, very on vogue. Uh, you know, we had the X games, blah, blah, blah. So X and A is basically an amalgamation of DNA with an X thrown on the front. But what was really important about it is XNA was really cool. Um, they did a very, very, very good job with that library. It was very straightforward, very accessible. It's not um it's not an absolute beginner library for sure. Uh, you probably would get further with uh, something like Love, uh, based on Lua, or a number of JavaScript libraries. Much more user friendly. Same with uh, Game Maker or uh, its ilk, Construct Two. Those kind of things. Those are more accessible. Uh, game platforms than XNA, but XNA hit that right balance. You could, as a somewhat beginner, struggle your way through and nail it, but if you were serious about actually writing games, not only was it accessible, but it was actually capable. Um, so they did launch the Xbox Independent Games channel on the 
uh, I think we're talking Xbox 360 at this point. Yeah, 360 only. And so all the games that you originally saw on that indie channel were made in um, XNA. And then, for some reason, of course, Microsoft is not the type to support other platforms. Microsoft created XNA to run on the Xbox and on uh, Windows XP of the day. Uh, it was basically to drive adoption of both of those platforms and, of course, to, to bring in developers to their platform. Uh, but they only really ever extended it to Windows Phone support. And for the seven people that bought one of those, it was lovely. But for the rest of the world, the mobile world specifically, it didn't touch. So you had Android come along. You had iOS come along. And both were huge, huge markets. And XNA was a non-starter there. All right, so we're going to switch over in time a little bit with our history here. Uh, there were two separate projects on the go for porting XNA to two different platforms. Uh, one was called Silver Sprite, and I loved Silver Sprite at the time. It was a very cool, small project, and the entire idea was to make XNA work on Silverlight. Now, you may not even remember Silverlight at this point, but Silverlight was Microsoft's Flash competitor. It ran in the browser. Uh, in my humble opinion, it was way better than Flash, but that whole... Uh, virtual machine in a browser thing just sort of died off. Uh, adoption wasn't there. There was a bunch of security concerns, etc., etc. So that was a bit of a dead end. But at the time, it wasn't. And Silverlight um, was kind of coming on strong. It was used to um, broadcast NBC's first Olympics online, and that was an awesome site. That, that was one of the best online experiences I've had. So it kind of showed the power of what Silverlight could do. And it, unlike HTML at the time, HTML5 was just a concept then. Uh, so Flash and Silverlight enabled you to do things in the browser that you, you just couldn't do any other way. Um, so again, there was the Silver Sprite port, which was an attempt to get XNA's 2D capabilities, at least, running in the browser, in the Silverlight plugin. Now, on the other hand, there was Mono Touch. I think it was called Mono Touch. Let me verify. One second. Nope. Sorry. XNA Touch is what it was originally called. And those two... That one was a port of XNA to, uh, I believe, Android at the time, and eventually iOS. So that was uh, one of the projects was to run it in Silverlight. The other one was to run it um, in mobile. And those two eventually merged together. And that's when we got XNA Game. And essentially, you can think of XNA Game, uh, sorry, Mono Game. You can think of Mono Game as, uh, and it's basically an open source cross-platform implementation of XNA. And they did a very good job. It took a while to get there, uh, but they pretty much created, recreated the entire API. But on the back end, instead of you know being tied to the fixed pipeline and using um, DirectX calls, etc., that would only run on Microsoft platform, they did an OpenGL back end. They used OpenAL for audio, etc. So they they re-implemented all the native things for each platform on those platforms. Now, along came um, Xamarin. Xamarin is the company behind Mono. Originally, it was Novell. Uh, Novell kind of Let's see, Novell bought Zeus, kind of went bankrupt. The people behind um, C Sharp or Mono's development inside of the Novell group spun off and they formed a company called Xamarin. And Xamarin basically, first off, make Mono. Uh, there are obviously it's an open source project, other people contribute to it, but Xamarin are the, uh, uh, what's the word, the coordinators, or like they, they run the project. Uh, and on top of that, they create a couple of products, one called Xamarin Studio. Uh, and that's a cross-platform IDE. Uh, specifically, if you're going to do any development for C Sharp on Linux or Mac OS, you're probably going to use Xamarin Studio to do it. Uh, on Windows, I would say that Visual Studio is still king, but on those other platforms, it is definitely uh, the best solution for C Sharp, at least in my humble opinion. Uh, so they make this cross-platform IDE, uh, and then on top of that, they create a bunch of products called Xamarin.iOS, Xamarin.Android, and Xamarin.Mac. Each one of those is kind of a, a .NET port for each of those platforms, and then kind of an interface layer towards the underlying library. So they, they take the, for the iOS example, they take the underlying framework and they expose it to C-sharp developers, but they also take the C-sharp way of doing things and kind of make it smooth on that platform. So if you're a C-sharp developer and you want to port your application to these platforms, Xamarin comes in for that. But if you need access to the underlying code, the, the native abilities of that platform, Xamarin also provides that. So that's essentially what Xamarin does. They're this cross-platform provider for um, C-sharp, or sorry, .NET 
pr products across non-Microsoft platforms. Now, in recent years, Microsoft's really embraced Xamarin. They're basically, um, they're open sourcing a bunch of the .NET framework. They're working close with Xamarin to actually make these products go out. Microsoft's taken a real big about face about their support of other platforms. Um, so Xamarin is a very stable, very important cog in this machine. And they, they do provide you this ability to port across these numbers of platforms. So suddenly you have this XNA product that is now workable on um, Android, on uh, Linux, on Mac, on iOS, on Windows Phone, on Windows itself, etc. Now at the same time, after XNA4, Microsoft killed XNA off. Uh, pissed off they did this. It's a terrible move. Uh, but there was a lot of things going on at Microsoft at the time. And there was a bit of a, a civil war going on among the VPs. And the wrong VP lost. And with that VP losing, um, a lot of the projects that he backed got the boot. Um, Zune's pretty much dead. Zune had its own reasons for dying, but that was among them. Uh, XMA, XNA was one of the casualties. Uh, there was a tablet called the Courier that a lot of people were really excited about. It's gone as a result. So in the blow-up from this, XNA basically became a non-product. Uh, and as a result, you also saw what happened with Microsoft's huge lead with indie developers was pissed away. So that was a sad day for a lot of developers. Um, Mono game was, sorry, XNA was a very good introduction and platform to jump into actual commercial releases. Well, Model Game basically went from being a cross-platform port of XNA to being XNA. So now Mono Game is kind of evolving beyond that. And one of the big hang-ups, one of the big things that Visual Studio always did, but Mono Game kind of sucked at, was content pipeline support. You see, there were a bunch of input processors or content processors built into XNA that enabled you to do things like drop in an FBX file, a 3D file, or an audio file, or uh, textures, etc. And they were converted into an XMB binary file uh, that was efficient and ready to use for XNA. Well, this content pipeline was never really replicated in Mono Game until just recently. Uh, so that was a big hang-up, is if you wanted to do uh, content development using um, Monogame, you had to keep around a version of XNA Studio from like 2010. Um, so this means you had to have a Windows machine somewhere in there. You had this kind of inefficient workflow because you had to go back and bundle your content. Now you could just bring the XMB, the generated files, and use them uh, on your way out. But this, this double process of creating content was always a bit of a pain in the ass. And fortunately now, they've created their own content pipeline. So that is what we have today. You can think of Mono Game in a nutshell. It's XNA4, but cross-platform, and they're now in charge. Uh, I don't know where they're going to go with it. I don't know um, if they're going to be evolving the features, etc. But it is definitely nice to see someone picked up and carried the XNA. Now, before you sit back and think to yourself, well, yeah, this is a toy. This is outdated. Nobody's using this thing. Why should I care? That's where you're wrong. There are some very big name, very successful indie size uh, or large indie sized games that were made with XNA or with Mono Game. I gotta stop mixing those two up. Sorry, with Mono Game as especially for the porting. And these are games you've heard of, like Fez, like Bastion, or more recently Skulls of the Shogun. So this isn't a toy. Um, Mono Game is definitely being used for creating commercial shipped games. It's a nice, clean API. Now, there are a few uh, definite downsides, and I'll throw those out there right away. Uh, first off, remember that Xamarin Studio I was talking to you about? Well, iOS or Android platforms of Xamarin aren't free. Uh, this is probably the biggest um, flaw in this process, is you actually have to pay. Uh, so let me just bring that up quickly. If you want to support those particular platforms, you need to license Xamarin for them. And that costs you $25 a month at the minimum. Uh, let's see, does that have any limitations that would bother you? Uh, nope, there's no, uh, no screen put up in front or anything. So yeah, there's what you're looking at, it's $25 a month. And I don't know if you can just do one month compile for that platform and you'd be done with it. But I do want you to be aware there is a cost to port to iOS or Android. So that's probably the biggest negative here. Um, the other thing is, again, that cost is per developer, per platform. So that's $25 a month for iOS, 
and $25 for Android, and that's per developer. So you have a team of 10 developers working on both platforms. My math is failing me. That's $500 a month, I think. Yes, it's $25 per platform, 10 users, 250 bucks, two platforms, $500. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you've got a team of 10 people working on a game, 500 bucks should not be a really big barrier to, sorry, per month. Even still, should not be a gigantic barrier to you. But do be aware that there is this price tag involved. And this is a world where increasingly, with the likes of um, Unreal and um, Unity making free versions revenue cap, where people are not expecting to pay any money. So this is, yes, this is definitely a negative. Now, do keep in mind, you can target, target sorry, um, Mac, Windows, Linux, Windows Phone, all free. So those do not have a price tag involved. So this is just for the iOS or Android ports that there is a price tag attached. Uh, another thing to be aware of is actually Mono is the license technology or the runtime that Unity is actually using. The only difference is Unity is paying the licensing fee for you. Uh, but they've licensed an old version of Mono to underpower Unity. So don't think of Mono as this um, small open source project either. It's very, very, very production tested. There are literally thousands of games out there that are commercially sold that are running on top of the Mono framework. So don't let that put you off. But this part very well might. So there is definitely a price tag attached. Be aware of that. But again, this is only when you're going to those devices um, and only for those two particular platforms. The next thing, this is sort of a plus or this is sort of a minus. It depends on your perspective. But uh, XNA itself isn't a high-level framework. If you've worked with LibGDX, LibGDX is sort of a comparable. I've always felt that those two frameworks were very similar. However, LibGDX has built a ton of stuff over top. XNA has not, at least not in the core library. So you might find things that you expect to be available aren't, and you're going to be rolling your own. Things like, um, you know, you can do sprite sheets, for example, but the sprite sheet functionality you're doing. You know, you, you can draw from a source rectangle of a texture, etc., but there's no sprite.frame.1.get kind of thing. There's, that functionality is not there. You're going to be rolling your own for a lot of stuff. Same for animation. Animation is basically done by uh, incrementing between those things, keeping track of it yourself. You are rolling your own for a ton of the stuff. TMX maps. Uh, there's a library available to do it, but it's not part of the core. So the core itself is more... Here's the stuff you need to make a game, go make a game. You have to build up your libraries on top of it. Now, keep in mind, XNA has been around since 2006, and there is a lot of code out there. Uh, so you can easily get this stuff to roll your own. Just keep in mind that the framework itself works at a lower level of abstraction than a lot of the stuff that's out there. And for some people, that's a huge plus, especially people that want as much control as possible. For others, it's a minus. Now, the, the underlying bits, though, uh, it's got everything you need. There's code in there for handling input. There's code in there for handling um, graphics, sound. Uh, sounds a bit of a catch because some of it's missing. Uh, for networking, um, like all the basic bits that make up a game are there and in a cross-platform manner. And that's kind of nice. But you are going to be building a lot more code on top of that. Now, there's a lot of people that question, like, where does a game engine start and a game begins? And, and XNA ends at a slightly lower level than other game engines. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, as I was saying. There's also no uh, level editing tools or the likes. Uh, as I said, there's no TMX map loader. But there is code available. There's libraries available for adding that. There's code available for adding physics, etc. Uh, you could use Tile, the editor. But you have to bring all the pieces together. But as I said, all of the pieces are out there. And tying them together, there's thousands of examples. There are books galore for dealing with... Um, XNA programming in general. Now, the mono-specific stuff is where you start to struggle a bit. Where is, how does mono implement this? Where's the differences, etc.? And that's a bit of, we'll cover that in this tutorial series, so don't worry over much. Uh, now let's just look very, very quickly at mono. One thing to be aware of, mono is essentially a library. Uh, so there's not a lot to show you. It's a bunch of .NET assemblies that you use to write a game. And on top of that, there's a content pipeline. So once you've done the install, uh, I'm showing you in Visual Studio, but the... Uh, the mono, uh, sorry, the uh, Xamarin Studio uh, workflow is almost identical. It creates the same templates and you work the same way, uh, just a different look. Uh, but it will install a number of different templates for a number of different projects. Now, ultimately, what you end up doing is generally you create your content 
uh, as a standalone thing. We'll show you the content processor in a second. Um, you do as much of your code as possible as a library, standalone in its own project, and then you'll create uh, a project for each platform, and you put the platform specific such in each one, the platform specific stuff in each one. Uh, but for a simple game, you could just come down, create your project, drop your project. Um, content in it and off the races but it is pretty simple to go ahead and you basically create one project for each platform and then another project for all of your shared code making cross-platform development quite simple um, but as you can see there it does create these project types for uh, most of what you'll use uh, including for a DirectX and an OpenGL backend now, originally DirectX was uh, XNA is built on DirectX um, that's the X part now, uh, Mono itself, on every platform that isn't Microsoft related, the back end is OpenGL. Uh, OpenGL is the cross-platform game library of choice. Uh, and then on top of OpenGL, there's OpenAL, which is an audio library. Both are used. Uh, so you can use now an OpenGL back end on Windows so that you have a consistent across-the-board OpenGL implementation. Or you could create you know, Windows Phone, uh, Microsoft Universal Project, which is for their RT or uh, straight Windows 8 exposure, and this is dead. Uh, Microsoft killed off the RT project, so this isn't going to matter much in the future. But Android, OUYA. Uh, and if we were sitting on uh, Xamarin Studio, you would also see an iOS option here. Uh, so once again, you still need iOS to ultimately deploy on an and on a uh, iOS device. Okay, that didn't make any sense. You need OS X to deploy on an iOS device. They didn't get around that. So you still need a Mac or to use something like Mac and Cloud or a Hackintosh, which isn't legal and I didn't suggest. But uh, you do need ultimately to sign it to get it out anyways. Uh, but you create your project right here. We'll start with a standard Windows one just to show you what happens. Uh, it'll create a very simple template called game1.cs. Uh, I'm not even going to touch on the code at all. Uh, very simple implementation, inherits from the class game, and implements the things like initialization, loading the content, unloading content, updating, and drawing. So essentially, it's just an encapsulation of a game's lifestyle, the loading, the unloading, and then an update and render loop. And that's kind of essentially it. You run the default, you get this nice blue screen. Ta-da! And finally, you'll notice over here, if you go into content, oops, content, it's created this mgcb file. Uh, and this is actually a link. If I go into the properties on it, you'll see it's being, its build action is um, a content reference. And this is sort of like a, if you think in terms of Linux, it's sort of like a soft link to the content itself. So in XNA, you can say, you know, load this. And instead of going from the file system, it goes through this um, translation layer or a reference or whatever you want to call it and then loads the underlying file so this means you can create versions for each different platform and I'll show you that quickly so just double click this guy and I'll load up the content tool um, this is a somewhat recent uh, addition to monogame this is what monogame made monogame viable in my opinion for cross-platform development because now you no longer need a copy of XNA game studio around you can create your content pipeline using this guy and it's just simply a matter of content root here You'll see, if I look down here at the properties, you can pick the platform you want to deploy for and profile. Profile, I'm, I'm not going to get into that in this, but they basically did um, two sets of profiles. And they added Reach, I believe, when they added Windows Mobile. And it's a stripped-down version. And you're probably going to want to use Reach for most of your um, deployment. But if you're doing uh, high-def PC-only development or... Um, Xbox only development, you can stick with the, the high def format, but that's what this profile is all about. But you can come in here and you can pick your platform. Okay. Like so. And you can see there are a lot predefined. And what this does is this massages your content for that output. So um, if you add an audio file and it's not in a format that iOS can use, for example. So when you build for iOS, it turns it into an iOS for, um, format. Um, if your images need to be formatted a different way for a different platform, it takes care of that. So all you have to really do is you have to come in here and basically build your content for each platform that you need. And I'll show you a very simple job. Uh, we'll do a Windows one. And let's just add something to it. So first thing is we're going to add an existing item and we'll just add a texture. I did this in the uh, getting started profile as well. So if this seems all familiar, if you've done one of those, you can just skip ahead. They're not really doing too much. Uh, we'll copy it in like so. So now we have a texture available in our content pipeline. And you can see down here the processor, uh, 
this is the importer that's being run. It's automatically figured out that it's a texture. Um, but there are these other importers that are available. So uh, like FBX is 3D models. Effects files are kind of like shaders, sort of. Uh, we'll cover that later. Uh, sprite fonts is a font definition file over top of a TTF file. Uh, video, MP3s, etc. Uh, WA audio. Uh, you can bring in all these different kind of things. And it automatically figures out. So in this time, it knows it's a texture. So it's running the texture processor. And you can pass in parameters to this. Uh, your color key is, um, if you're not using transparency, it's the background color to use uh, for rendering transparencies, basically. Um, you can have it automatically gen generate MIP map, which are multiple resolution images used for as things get further and further away. Uh, or you can even have it come in here and compress or not compress or use DXT compression for your image. Or you can have it resized to being a power of two on input so that you know if your platform requires power of two uh, textures, it will automatically do so. Um, so each importer or each import processor has a set of parameters that can be called that will uh, run when your content is actually imported. So we've got our content pipeline. We have our uh, asset right here with a horrible name. I wonder if I can rename it right here. No, I don't think I can. Should have given it a better name. You know what? I'll do that. Uh, let's go with logo instead. There. So it's brought into your content. We're not going to do anything to it. We'll just stick with it. And then when you're done, you just go ahead and build it. And uh, yeah, we'll save our project. And you see, it just went ahead and built it. So now if we wanted to do the same thing for iOS instead, we could come in here and go, all right, so instead of that, stop doing that. Instead of that, we want iOS and build. And that's it. So it's simple to support multiple platforms. Very, very simple. Simple to bring in your content, uh, as you saw. So let's just switch this back to Windows because that's actually what we need. Uh, Windows, and let's do a rebuild just in case because we want to save it. All right, so there we have our version. So now this is sort of like a virtual file system over top of our content. We go back here. Let me just bring this over to the window. Uh, where is that? My Visual Studio projects. I think I use the default. So Visual Studio projects. Uh, I have no idea what I called this. Game two. Very very intuitive. That was in your content folder, which as you'll see over here, is mirrored there. And then it's created. Oops, not bin. I'm in the wrong. What the hell? Content. Bin. Windows. And there's the file. It's generated this XMD file. But instead of having to bring this file in or do anything with it, you've got this guy set as a content reference. So now you can use your content very, very simply in your game. So right uh, here in your load content, we could just as easily go as uh, var my, oops, come on, logo equal, and then con oh, this dot content dot load, and we're loading type texture 2D, and then you just pass in the name minus an extension. And done. So that's how easy it is to access content once it's been generated here. Now this guy will automatically figure out, you know, which folder, which platform is. So you would create one of these files essentially for each platform and drag that particular thing into each solution so that it's native. Uh, but the process of building and maintaining all those different pipelines is uh, very, very simple, very, very straightforward. And this was a missing piece. So it used to be that you needed to have the old IDE around. You needed to have a Windows machine to generate it. Well, this guy runs just as well on Mac and I believe Linux now. Uh, so you can truly create cross-platform games in an efficient manner on any platform you want uh, using X, uh, XNA via Mono Game. So that is essentially a nutshell of what Mono Game provides. A little bit of a history, probably that you didn't want, <laughs> etc. Uh, the code. The code is exactly what we're going to cover from here on out. Uh, for the most part, there's no tools. Uh, there's the content pipeline, uh, and then the stuff that it calls behind the scenes, which is sort of transparent to you, and there are the libraries, and that's it. So this is going to be a very, very code-focused tutorial series. I uh, hope you enjoy it. I hope uh, you're a bit intrigued. If you never checked out um, XNA the first time around, 
it's a nice library to work with. Uh, it, it works at a, a nice level. It's pleasant to program with. I really enjoy it. Um, we'll probably move pretty fast on at least covering the basics, so hopefully it stays pretty exciting. Um, so that's it. I, I hope I've interested you and that you'll continue tuning in. Uh, so once again, there's also going to be a text-based version of this entire series. Uh, I'm doing it all together. I'm actually starting this, I'm authoring the text stuff in book format and breaking them off into blogs. So as I go, I will actually have and be generating that book I was talking about on um, Patreon. So if you are a backer, you can also get this in book form. Same thing that you're getting on the webpage for free in all honesty, except for it's bundled as a book. So it'll be formatted in book form, available as at least a PDF download, but possibly in um, other formats that people demand. Um, and, you know, you can print it off, bring it offline, do whatever you want with, load it on your Kindle, load it on uh, your iPad or whatever, you know, and not need an internet connection to, to go ahead with. So if that's a, an area you're interested in uh, pursuing, uh, I would greatly appreciate you helping me back. Um, and that's that's new. I, I, I hope to do it with all tutorial series going forward. And don't worry, if, if you're not a backer, you're still getting all the same content. You're just not getting it bundled as a book. You're getting it as a blog, just like you have been all along. And of course, I'll be doing videos for each section as we go too. So if you're a video learner, Stay tuned to YouTube, and I will have all the programming pieces as we go. Uh, so that is Model Game. Uh, this is the very beginning of a brand new series. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, please stay tuned. Cheers.